agree. Okay, we're here back, and now we're the questions. Okay, Jonathan Alter, do you agree with the Democrats' decision to keep their primary debates off Fox News? Uh, no, I, I agree that they, you need to hunt where the ducks are. Right. Uh, but, you know, people don't know that four years ago, the RNC canceled the NBC News de Republican debate because they didn't like the way the CNBC debate had gone right. earlier. So this idea that somehow something horrible has been done by Tom Perez, the Democratic Party chairman, is not true. And they actually haven't had a Fox debate in the Democratic Party since 2004. So this, it's not like this is something they do every year and are canceling now. But you have to take every opportunity yes. to reach voters. Yeah, they, they, yeah. Uh, right. They got the votes on MSNBC. And it already. just feeds into the wrong yeah. narrative anyway. So just put it right. like Matt and said earlier. If you want to play, get in the game and play. And right. you can reach Wisconsin without even going there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Michael, is there anyone in the Republican Party who can mount a credible primary challenge to Donald Trump? Uh, good question. Uh, there are a number of folks who are already starting to look at that. Certainly Governor Weld, former governor of Massachusetts, is already in the game. Uh, my governor of, of Maryland, Larry Hogan, who just won re-election in a blue state that's outnumbered Republicans two to one, uh, has done a good job of governing, uh, is looking at the race, and there's a lot of excitement about his potentiality. He brings something to the conversation that I think sets up a, a perfect contrast between Trumpism or Republican Trumpism and traditional Republican ideas and, and mm -hmm. governance. So I think that's a, that's a, a conversation we still need to have internally. Um, I have some real concerns about a lot of the value sets that we have jettisoned uh, because of the cult of personality that has always bothered me from the very beginning. And, and so if we get someone involved in the narrative that can uh, reemerge the, the idea that we still stand for free markets, that we still should not spend more money than we take in, that we should not burden future generations with debt and deficits, that we should empower communities to make decisions for themselves, that's a debate I think well, inside the Republican seems Party, like, we should be ready to have. Seems like, like we lost thousands of I mean, years for, ago. The That's, question should really be what do you want to achieve through a primary uh, challenge, right? Because unseating the president right. is extremely unlikely. So do you want to move the president in your direction? And in that sense, who do you want to run in? Right. And, but, but again, yeah. that's, that's going to be part of a national conversation that you, can take place in a microcosm. You mentioned really deficits. I right. noticed at CPAC this year, and I've watched it every year, yeah. That there used to be when Obama was president, there was a lot of stuff about the deficit and the yeah. debt, and this year it seemed to be good. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's just a moment. It's not true. There was, just a it was mentioned. We had Tim Chapman there from Heritage Foundation. We had Senator Purdue from Georgia. No, the fact is, is this, which is both parties deserve to be horsewhipped over their profligate spending. I mean, $22 trillion in debt. Someone's going to eventually say, hey, guys. You're going to have to do something Matt, about this. But only one, a but trillion only... with the tax cut. A trillion dollars. Look, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you about the need for the tax cut. I actually think America was growing less and less competitive because of our, our four, fourth highest corporate tax rate. But I do agree with you on spending. Let's do something about spending. Let's do something about entitlement. Well, we the, that, that was the tax rate. It wasn't what they... What they actually no, I'm talking about effective. It I'm adds to effective. the deficit really? in a way, Matt. No, no, whether, you, whether you add okay. spending or... But only one party was the one who proudly wore this mantle of we're the party of fiscal responsibility. That was just and, a, a con, right? And I agree. Our party okay. has been terrible at this. Okay. Terrible okay. And you tell years. them that? Catherine would agree. I totally agree. What a lot of people don't realize is over the last four and, years, Republicans have been a lot worse Republican presidents than Democratic presidents. Uh, you know, Obama and Clinton brought down the deficit. With a Republican Congress in Clinton's True. case, but he oversaw a balanced budget. Okay. Uh, Noah, doesn't the lenient sentencing of Paul Manafort suggest that racial bias still exists in our judicial system? Well, it could. Um, I, I, so I'm a fan of judicial discretion, right? Judicial discretion as an alternative to uh, mandatory minimums. Mandatory minimums right. are unjust. Um, however, the, so the notion here that the, ju the judicial system is imperfect because it's just it was created by the hands of man is something that I think all of us would agree. That sometimes the judicial system fails sure. people. That's why you have the power of pardon to to save people from uh, from conditions that are unjust. The social justice prescription, the Rawlsian prescription, John Rawls's prescription, is to create institutions that are dedicated to establishing justice by treating individuals unequally, essentially exacerbating the very condition that is making the judicial system unjust in the first place. That is the flaw in Rawlsian thought. That is the flaw in social justice thought. Okay. There isn't such a thing as social justice thought. It, it, it's, it's something that you've constructed as a way of... 
well, in, in theory, that you're reading in the, in the academy. But for most people, social justice means trying to make society better. And why do you need to turn it into some sort of a caricature. Because, it because there it is, is a caricature of some of it. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, it's like... So, this isn't an abstract idea, Because I, I, I completely it is agree on the specific cases. So speak out but against those in the, cases. But they're in the news but every the day, and of, people see that. I think when, when people, to when make people were asked better, like, what, what they, why they like Trump, the number one thing they said was he's not politically right. correct. It's a huge and, issue. And that doesn't mean he's not also a huge right. asshole. But that was a breath of fresh yes, air in right. a country that was choking yes. and is yes. choking on political correctness. Right, but that there doesn't is a mean difference. That you have to turn the idea of social justice into a... No, Jonathan, I liberals are for social justice. Liberals want to protect people. The people we're going after want to protect feeling. I completely agree. There's an okay, umbrage. Then why are we arguing? If there's we completely agree. Culture. Why are we arguing? Why are we arguing? We, an every time I get to something, we completely <laughs> agree. Everyone agrees. We might also agree that we need a lot of reform in our criminal justice system. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's and you didn't get there, and we, and we just signed a bill, and you didn't get there by telling people to sit down, shut up, and check their no, privilege. that's right. Okay. Uh, John, do you agree with Elizabeth Warren's plan to break up the tech companies? Uh, you know, she, she just came up with it, but I do think that a lot of antitrust uh, action, the way Theodore Roosevelt and other presidents did, is called for right now. We haven't had antitrust in a long time, and Louis Brandeis was right that bigness can sometimes equal badness, and they, they abuse consumers when they get too big, and I think that is starting to happen with the tech companies. They, sh they should take but can't, a but close look at it. But can't you just hold bigness to be accountable for what they do? But they're I mean, not because, being held accountable. Because, that's well, that's, but, that's, but that's part of the problem. You can break them up and still not address the underlying that's problems right. that's true. That, that cause the behavior that everyone's upset about. So instead of trying to deconstruct something that was built at the hands yeah. in, the, in the sweat of someone who took the very risks that were necessary to create a Google and a Microsoft soft, et cetera, instead of saying, well, we, it's too big now because we don't know what to do with it. Let's right. break it down. Well, Let's well, look at the underlying issues that cause the concern that, that a lot of us have. To do have that, you have to have regulation. Well, you guys are against regulation. So that's, it's not, well, that's, that's, that's not true. That's, that's, not, true. No, no, that's no. not true. That's not true. That's not true. And I think basically consumers should be able to control their data. They should be able to exactly. decide what they do. And these privacy policies and all these platforms are ridiculously complex. And what we're learning is they just override any box you check anyway. And, that, and that's well, probably I, a fraud. I tell Take matters into my own hands and just lecture my Alexa because I know it goes straight to the top. <laughs> <laughs> the CIA. Right, well, that, no, you well, thank you me. very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>